your hosts have earned a reputation as fierce and effective advocates inside and outside of the courtroom. Both partners are experienced trial attorneys who have been board certified in family law by the Texas Board of Legal Specialization. Thanks for tuning in to the For Better, Worse, or Divorce podcast, uh, where we provide you tips and insight on how to navigate divorce and child custody situations. I'm Brian Walters, joined by my law partner, Jake Gilbreth. And today, as part of our real estate and divorce series, we'll be discussing another common question we get asked, and that is if you should move out of the marital home during the divorce and all of the, all of the things, you know, sub-questions that come up as a result of that. Um, so I think there's several factors to think about um, when when you think about moving out of the house. I mean, clearly, if you're going to get divorced, eventually someone's moving out of the house and maybe ultimately both of you if the house gets sold. Uh, so um, let's talk about that kind of in order. I think probably the, uh, the first one that comes to mind is um, financial considerations um, on temporary orders. So just to be clear, Texas doesn't have legal separation. Most other states, when you move, you know, when you file for divorce or separate, your financial world uh, severs at that time, um, and you kind of each go on a day-to-day -day basis on your own. That's not the case in Texas. You file for divorce, you're still a financial entity together, um, and so that causes some very specific issues. Um, so. Jake, do you want to tell us a little bit about, you know, let's say it's sort of the typical arrangement, somebody files for divorce, um, one of the two spouses is going to move out of the house. What do they both need to be thinking about financially when, when that decision is made? Right. So, well, first and foremost, what we always say is, you know, think about safety first. We've talked about this kind of in other episodes, um, but it's important enough to bring up right off the bat. Like it's, you, you do want to sort of think through financially how a move out is going to impact you or how it may impact who gets the house and the divorce, about whether or not you stay in the house or not. But ultimately, safety is the most important thing, right? So if you're in an unsafe situation, do not do not stay in an unsafe situation because of something that um, you think is going to impact the financial arrangement in your overall divorce. And know that there's remedies. Um, you know, if you're in a family violence situation and family violence has occurred recently, the court may uh, issue what's called an ex parte protective order, kicking somebody out of the house. Uh, there may be other remedies for emergency relief from the court. I mean, talk to a lawyer if you're in an unsafe situation and always keep your safety and your children's safety upmost priority. As far as sort of planning, right, it's just do I move out, do I not? It kind of goes into this bigger question people have, who's going to get the house in the divorce? If I move out, is my spouse going to get the house in the divorce? Um, and, and how is a decision to move going to impact me? So financially speaking, right, if, um, if you're moving out of the house, you sort of think ahead of, and it's important to talk to a lawyer during this time, think ahead of, like, am I going to be able to afford, first of all, where I'm moving? If I'm moving into a place that's going to require monthly rent um, or, you know, I've, uh, some type of some type of lease is probably not going to be the situation where you're looking to buy something, but you know have a lease either six months or a year. Can I afford it? Right? Maybe you can afford a month or two, um, but you know what's your cash flow going to look at while a divorce is pending? And so that that kind of dovetails into the topic of how are bills paid when a divorce is pending? And it's a difficult decision to make as far as moving out because it's a lot of times you don't know when that decisions ripe to be made. You don't know what the financial situation is going to be. Um, the worst case scenario is if you don't even know what your finances are because a spouse, for whatever reason, has um, maybe kept you from that information or that's just the way your marriage was set up where you don't have that information. And so you're making these big financial decisions without knowing what the situation is. But remember, you know, when a, when a divorce is pending, a court is going to put in place temporary orders. And temporary orders are what's the rules that govern while a case is pending. And a lot of times people agree on temporary orders, but if they can't agree on temporary orders, then a judge is gonna decide. And those temporary orders are gonna talk about who lives where. Like we've said in other episodes, a judge is not gonna have the spouses living in the same house together while divorce is pending. Uh, I guess in theory you can agree to that, but that, just, it's, that rarely works, um, as you can imagine. Um, but you could agree to that, or, or but, but a judge is gonna say, okay, here's where um, this spouse lives, what's where that spouse lives, and 
if there's kids, this is what the possession schedule is going to be. Here's how we're going to pay for bills. Um, and here's how we're going to move you all forward to get to a final trial. That can be hard, though, if you're thinking about moving out before those temporary orders because you don't know what the situation, what the financial situation is going to be. Um, so, Brian, what do you do in those, uh, those situations? You have a client coming. Let's say it's going to be two weeks before you have a temporary orders hearing, two, three weeks, which is not atypical um, that it would take that long to have a temporary orders hearing. Do I stay in the house? Do I not stay in the house? Um, again, you know, obviously per, uh, personal um, safety is most important, but how do I make that decision if I don't know what the temporary orders are going to be or how we're going to pay for things? Yeah, as, as you said, safety first, for sure. Um, and then I think we get into questions about, you know, do we have children? Um, do we have a potential custody battle? So assuming that's the case, um, that that's the most common reason we, I think we get this question is should I leave the house is, is I think people worry about how that might affect a custody case um, and, and it can so we should probably talk about that for a few minutes so again in a situ situation where there's not an immediate safety concern and where you think there could be a conflict over co possession or access or custody I think we do need to think about this carefully um, if you leave a house prior to a temporary orders hearing um, and you leave the kids with the other spouse and you just kind of set up shop somewhere else um, and you don't see the kids much or very, very frequently, especially overnights, that, that can be a problem. Um, that could be viewed by a court as you conceding that the other parent should have custody or that the children are not that important to you. The most important thing is to get on with your life or something along those lines. So I do think you need to be careful about that. I think courts are smart enough to know that, that sometimes people just need to separate and sometimes um, you just don't have an agreement and, and you just have to get out of the house and, um, you know, and you just have to go those two or three weeks with, with um, uncertainty or even seeing your kids less than, than you want to. Um, but that can be a problem um, at least that's from what I've seen. Is that your your view or your experience with it as well? Yeah, yeah. That's that's. Um, it can be a problem if somebody it's, if somebody moves out. Particularly, I think we talked about this in other episodes. If you don't have a possession schedule in place for kids and you move out, um, and then you say, "Well, we've talked about it," uh, and my understanding is we're doing week on week off or fifty fifty schedule, and your spouse who has the kids is that stay in the house said, we never, I'm not doing that. I talked to a lawyer. We're not doing that anymore. And then you don't have a possession schedule until you get to court, um, which can be a very difficult thing. So sometimes, again, safety first. Sometimes it is, though, where we don't move out until there's ground rules put in place. That can be a not fun situation. Uh, so it's all balance. It's all a balancing act. Um, of whether or not that's appropriate or not. But, you know, the, if somebody makes a decision before temporary orders to move out, that obviously will push, you know, have a log just add a logistical issue to the judge, right? It's not going to be absolute binding. Like Brian said, a lot of them are, will understand, she'll understand, you know, why somebody had to move out if that was the situation. But it's just another logistical issue. I, I view temporary orders largely as logistics, uh, not largely, a good portion of temporary orders is logistically how we're going to do with everything to get these folks divorced into a final resolution. And so if somebody's already moved out, uh, logistically, it's more difficult to switch. And have if wife's moved out um, and husband stayed in the house, that's not binding on the court whenever she hears temporary orders, but it's just another issue to consider of, okay, if I have wife stay in the house while the case is pending, I got to now move her back in and move husband out. Maybe that makes sense, but it's just another logistical issue to deal with. And of course, kids impacts all of this. Um, you know, stability is a big, big goal for for a judge on temporary orders. It's not binding. Um, it's not the only thing that a, a judge takes into consideration when she's making rulings, but it is something for uh, for her to consider um, when doing that. So, all those things go into uh, the move out. So let's talk a little bit more sort of logistics too. Um, you know, this is kind of a level of details that we have to think about in family law, but personal property and furnishings and stuff when you move out, that, it, you know, if you make the decision to move out or your spouse moves out, that's something that's got to be dealt with. And frankly, it needs to be dealt with probably in the outset. Um, 
So if somebody's moving out, I typically tell them, and I'd be curious if your thoughts, Brian, I typically tell somebody if you're moving out, take what you're, you know, you and your spouse agree to. You know, if there's a disagreement, please don't have don't have the cops called over uh, you know, the, the side table on, on the couch, right? If you can't have an agreement, don't get an arm wrestling match, but just take what y'all agree to. Um, and then keep an inventory, right? Just like you do for an insurance company, uh, for homeowners insurance, where you go around and you kind of get an inventory of your house or take pictures, particularly of valuables. Um, go ahead and, and do that because you'll, you know, maybe six months before you're in a mediation, maybe longer before you're in a mediation. And then trying to sit there and think, in a mediation, what furnishings or what valuables that I had in the house or, you know, my baseball card collection from when I was six years old, I left that in the house and I want to make sure I get that. Um, that can be hard to remember down the line. It, it's, I, I encourage people to try to work out personal property, particularly items of sentimental value towards the outset at the, at the beginning of the divorce. Um, it's it's really is a big tendency to just say we'll just deal with it at the end or just deal with it at the end, um, but it's easier to do it at the beginning when everybody's it's fresh on everybody's mind um, because there is I'll I'll tell you you know when you go to mediation there's nothing worse in mediation than settling a multi million dollar estate uh, and dealing with a complex child custody situation that may have a customized possession schedule. And then some complex uh, agreements that we've made on conservatorship for the kids and child support and all this stuff has been negotiated. Refinance has been negotiated, um, uh, you know, payouts, notes, interest rates, everything's been dealt with. And it's nine, nine o'clock at night and somebody goes, OK, so let's talk about the refrigerator magnets um, that are very sentimentally uh, big sentimental value to the husband who moved out or. By the way, I left my wedding ring in the family safe. Can I have that back? And it, it that can be a very emotional and taxing thing at the end of a long day of mediation. Um, and so I, I like to have people figure that stuff out well before mediation or final trial. Uh, there's also nothing worse than uh, trying a case for three or four days on a complex property division and, and then going at the end. By the way, Judge, now 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 is the point of my presentation. After arguing over this ten million dollar business valuation, now is the point of my presentation where I'd like to talk to you about the brown couch that's in the living room, not the brown couch that's in the dining room, the side room to the dining room table, uh, but the brown couch that's in the living room uh, next to the TV that I'll be talking to you about next because that's my client's TV and he or she wants it back. It's awful. Uh, deal with that right at the outset. What are your what are your thoughts on that, Brian? A hundred percent. I'm yeah, kind of smiled when you brought this up because I had that exact, it's very similar conversation yesterday with a client of a long, very complex, very difficult case ending in a multi-day trial. And uh, we got a ruling and everything. And that was the question I got asked is how I still need to get my yearbooks basically from high school. And this is a client who didn't take that out when he moved out and also didn't get it or bring it up nine months ago when he had it a ded dedicated chance to get in and get his stuff. And I just got mentioned, it just came up yesterday. And that was kind of my response was, well, at this point, you're technically divorced and it's basically her goodwill. If she, if she says, oh yeah, they're here, you can have them, good. If not, um, I'm not sure you're ever gonna see those um, again. She's gonna probably say, what yearbooks? I don't have them. And um, it's going to be impossible to prove it one way or the other, and it's not going to be of any interest to the judge. I'm pretty sure because they've already uh, they've already made rulings in the case. So yeah, totally agree. You got it. You got it right. Deal with that stuff up front, or else it li it will likely not get dealt with. Yeah, and and sometimes there's a good faith reason, right? Sometimes people just lose stuff, right? It's just like where's where is the that photo album, or where's the ring that my grandmother left me, or the china set, and just. It can range from good faith to bad faith, right? Where's my grandmother's uh, China set? Uh, I think we packed that away. It's in storage. Ranging from that to uh, there was a horrible, awful earthquake, and I'm so sorry your grandmother's china is all broken. Um, nothing else broke in the house, but your grandmother's china, who I never liked, by the way, it all got broken. Uh, so so sorry. And I threw it out. Uh, so it's in the dumpster. So deal with it's It's uh, – uh, both Brian and I are smiling because, you know, we always – divorce lawyers – I always tell people we deal with 
everything. We deal with a very, very important, everything's important, of course, but we deal with very complex issues on business valuations and valuations of the states and tracing and characterization. We deal with very complex uh, custody arrangements and, um, and decision making for kids. We deal with mental health professionals, financial experts, CPAs, valuations, uh, all that stuff. And we also deal with the brown couch sometimes. Uh, so do try to, uh, to work that stuff out at the beginning amongst yourselves if you can. But if not, um, you know, you got lawyers for a reason and I'm not above sending a letter about the brown couch if need be. I guess let's talk, so that's the personal property furnishings. Uh, we can obviously tell lots more war stories about that, but let's sort of um, turn to some questions that we've gotten. Um, and so, Brian, I'll pose this one to you and then maybe vice versa for some other ones, but um, one of those, we kind of addressed this one already, but let's let's ask it anyways, just to sort of, because it is an important issue. It says, somebody asked us, I think through our website, if I move out of the home temporarily, will it be challenging for my attorney to gain me access to move back in? Um, and let's, let's ask that for two questions. To gain me access is one question, um, but would the attorney be able to get me to move back in? Would that be challenging if you've already moved out? Yeah, it's a good point. So getting, getting access to the house to sort of like we talked about, get, get your stuff out, get items out of the house, um, maybe some of the furniture. Yeah, that, that's pretty typical. Um, you know, there might be some rules around it. You know, there needs to be a third party there or, you know, something along those lines, but an agreed list of things ahead of time, those type of things. But access isn't, isn't going to be a problem typically. Uh, moving back in, it sort of, we talked about this a bit before, but depends on why you left, right? I mean, if you were run out of there because of the domestic violence threat, sure, no problem. I, I think if the judge believes that's, that occurred and that's the reason for it, yes, I think you'll get right back in and the other person, the perpetrator, will be kicked out. Um, if it's if you just left because you got frustrated with each other or you wanted to spend more time with you know a, a girlfriend or boyfriend or something like that, um, maybe not. Um, so it depends a lot on the situation. Uh, but again, I, I would put your safety and your children's well-being ahead of any calculations about moving back in. Um, and, and again, for exactly as Jake said, it's just logistically difficult to start moving people back and forth uh, for a judge if there's a, a conflict, right? I mean, we got to pick a date for one person to get out. And then what if somebody damages the house or, you know, all those other kind of things. And so it's just easier a lot of times for the judge to keep the status quo rather than trying to switch people back and forth, in my experience. Okay, so here's a question. Can I file for abandonment if my spouse left the house and has not helped pay the bills? So I get, I've asked that question um, kind of both ways. Will I be accused of abandonment if I move out? Can I file for abandonment? So abandonment is is technically a ground for divorce, but those are uh, grounds for divorce. That's a longer discussion in a different podcast, but grounds for divorce kind of date back to, to times whenever you'd actually have to have fault for a divorce. If I'm going to get a divorce, I have to prove to the court fault like abandonment or adultery or cruelty. Texas uh, has what's called no-fault divorce. We use the term in supportability in the Texas Family Code. So you're not really filing for abandonment, right? There's no, like, legal action that I've been abandoned. The legal action is uh, filing for divorce. Um, if the spouse has left the house and not helped pay for the bills, then you'd be filing for divorce. And part of that divorce action would most likely be going to a judge on temporary orders and saying, you know, my spouse has moved out. And that spouse needs to help pay for the bills because we're married and this is our asset. So that would be that you'd be filing for divorce and addressing that in the court system. But it'd be filing for divorce that engaged the legal system. There's not a cause of action for abandonment. And then this one, Brian, we, we kind of um, addressed a little bit, but just can you force my spouse to leave the house, right? You say, come home and you say, I'm sorry, it's not working out. I filed for divorce. And I'd really appreciate if you go get a place to, to go stay. And your spouse says, I'm not moving. Um, and what happens then? The only person that can force your spouse out of the house is um, a judge. And um, sort of as we've talked about, that's kind of a descending order. If there's been recent family violence, a court could do that basically right away. Much more frequently, um, there's some type of temporary orders hearing a few weeks or a month or so after someone files for divorce. And then at that point, if either one of you want to not have the other person in the house, then the judge will make somebody 
somebody move out of the house. Um, so uh, that's the way to do it. Um, if you can agree without going to court, great, but that's, that's what it's going to take uh, otherwise. And then uh, last question, I left the home for a few days after a domestic dispute and my spouse has changed the locks. Uh, what can I do to get access to my belongings? So, so first of all, can I, I, we're repeating ourselves, but it's so important. If it's a domestic di dispute that involves violence, you need to consult with a lawyer right away um, and your safety is paramount. Um, and because one way back to get into the house may be through an ex parte protective order, protective order. Um, but you should not, you should particularly not self-help in a violent situation. Um, the best way of going about getting access to your belongings is through the court system. Um, now would be a good time, right? If you, if the spouse has changed the locks and you have some important belongings there to start making a list while it's fresh in your mind, in theory, although this is rarely the right move in theory, if it's your house too entitled to, you can change the locks right back, but that's, that's usually it's rare that drama is the right way of approaching a situation in a family law dispute. It's better to, um, even when the other side's, you know, acting in bad faith, uh, or has changed the locks and that wasn't an appropriate thing to do, even when the other side's not, not on good behavior, it's always best for you to be on good behavior and to consult with a lawyer. There are remedies back to those temporary orders that Brian was just talking about. That's when it's going to get um, addressed by a court system. It may feel very unfair before you get for a judge, depending on the situation. Uh, but I do encourage people to have faith in our legal system. Uh, my experience in practicing all throughout the state of Texas, and Brian, I know it, yours is the same, is obviously it's not in every single situation, but we have judges that really try to get things right. Um, and, and they're going to look at the whole situation. And if somebody's being an absolute jerk, uh, and I can't even get my toothbrush back, which is because I was staying in a hotel for a couple of days, it's just going to play into a judge's decision. So take a deep breath, count to 10, consult with a lawyer, I guess is probably the best approach in those situations. Absolutely. Okay. Well, that's all we have for today. If you like what you've heard today, do us a favor and leave us a review. We appreciate all your feedback, especially when it helps us make a better podcast. If you have any follow-up questions to this episode or would like to talk to any of us directly about your family law situation, reach out to us at uh, podcast at waltersgilbert.com or you can contact us directly through our website, waltersgilbert.com. I'm Brian Walters here with Jake Gilbreth, and thanks for listening. For information about the topics covered in today's episode and more, you can visit our website at waltersgilbreth.com. Thanks for tuning in to today's episode of For Better, Worse, or Divorce, where we post new episodes every first and third Wednesday. Do you have a topic you want discussed or a question for our hosts? Email us at podcast at waltersgilbreth.com. Thanks for listening. Until next time.